President Mohamed Buhari has approved the establishment of a 22-member presidential transition council ahead of the 2019, or rather, May 29 handover uh, to the next administration. The presidential transition council is to be headed by the Secretary General of the Federation, who will co coordinate the 2023 handover activities to ensure smooth transition of power from the current administration to the next. Members of the council include the head of service of the Federation, Solicitor General of the Federation, and permanent secretary of the Ministry of Justice. The council will be inaugurated on the 14th of February as the president will exit office on the 29th of May after two terms in office. Joining us to discuss and break this down is Aki Braithwaite. He is the governorship candidate of the National Rescue Movement, NRM. Thank you so much for joining us, Aki. Thank you for having me. It's, um, it's interesting that for the first time we're having to see a constituted um, panel or committee this early in, you know, in in the life of an election year, because of course the elections are yet to happen. But we know that Mr. President has mentioned it over and over again every time he gets the opportunity to say he cannot wait to live, he's done his best. Is this also um, Mr. President trying to show us that he will leave office when it's May 29th? So whatever assumptions or, um, you know, let's say propaganda that's out there that Mr. President might not want to hand over power in 20, May 29, could this be you know, a signal that he's ready? I think we have to applaud Mr. President this time around. Um, he has made a lot of statements about how he intends to make sure that he hands over um, a fair election. And um, I think these kind of uh, actions also, if any of his inner circle are in doubt mm -hmm. this kind of you know puts that to rest to say mm -hmm. hey look listen guys i don't care what you're thinking but this is the way i'm going and making that very very transparently obvious that um, in order to have a transition you everybody needs to know what is expected you know to happen so mm -hmm. just like the americans have it you know you know that once an election has taken place these are the steps you know that happen post uh, the yeah. election. I think it's a very, very good move and um, should be applauded. Many have questioned all of the things that are happening now leading up to the election, the fuel scarcity, which INEC has complained about, that it might hinder logistics, you know, and movement on election day, um, the, the lack of cash and, you know, the cost of living rising high and then Nigerians not even catching a break. And many people are saying this might, one way or the other, you know, stop the elections from happening. In fact, people have come up with all kinds of propaganda. Um, so why the hurry? I mean, because it's supposed to be post-election. That's when you say, okay, it's time for us to clean house and, you know, usher these other guys in. What's the hurry? We're yet to even have the elections. And many are worried if the elections are actually going to hold come February 25. Well, you could argue that um, if he just remained silent and... Uh, just let things run up to election. You could always keep saying, mm, there's doubt, is the election going to happen? Like a lot of people, mm. you know, are saying. But if Mr. President, uh, through his action, now puts in play a lot of the, including his people, you know, and saying, hey, look, guys, uh, now you've got to do this. So everybody's taking a role in terms of now ensuring that the incoming uh, president really has a smooth, you know, transition, has a welcome, mm. you know, to be able to come in. So the signs are there. I don't think it's in a hurry because, let's face it, the elections are only a couple of weeks away. A couple of days. Um, they, they're right here. So um, perhaps this should even have happened right at the beginning of the year, you know. So I think it's the timing is okay. Um, as to the issues around um, scarcity of petrol, around um, the cash, uh, it's, yeah, it's reading like a thriller. But um, I think there's a lot of conspiracy theory around this. Care to share that, some? Yeah, I think that the idea that, um, oh, some people, you know, went into a dark corner and some room and just said, oh, listen, let's, let's change the currency and then let's make sure that the currency isn't available. I think that runs counterintuitive and it's rather illogical. But uh, if you look at the fact that some of the banks have been complicit in hoarding the money, 
Uh, if you look at the issue of people having the money and spraying it at parties and all that, you know that it comes, I bring it right back to the whole issue of, um, you know, the corruption that has pervaded uh, mm. society. But, th but then a bank manager, um, <coughs> you know, in fact, not one, not two, many of them have complained um, live on radio to say, each one of us, would, this bank was given 100,000, that bank was given 150,000. How much money are we supposed to dispense? Um, so when they say a certain bank was hoarding monies, how, who do we believe? How true is the CBN? What truth is the CBN telling us? Because it's between the CBN and commercial banks. And I mean, I'm trying to understand why a bank would rather have that you break the windows and destroy the things in their banks as opposed to giving up monies if these monies were actually available. So it's, I mean, it's a he, he said, she said. We really don't know who to believe. Yeah. Um, you know, if you take the culture of our country and I think the last time we spoke I really um, mentioned that we have to get ourselves into an ethical state of mind. Mm -hmm. We have to decide if we truly want to be a modern society and that cuts across you know to every aspect of our lives. I've seen clips where uh, inspectors have gone into certain banks and you've seen the pile of new money you know that's there which actually should have been uh, dispensed. So yes he said, she said, you know, all of that. And the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? Um, but at the end of the day, I believe that we all have to sort of come to terms with a simple thing like changing currency. I find it difficult in my mind to imagine that, you know, the, the regulatory authority will say, we're changing the currency and then decide not to fund the currency, you know. Again, um, Yes, the conspiracy theory is that, yeah, they did that only to cause mayhem and pandemonium. And then in causing the pandemonium, you won't be able to have, you know, elections. Um, to me, I think that that is too much of a far-fetched uh, drama. You know, at the end of the day, uh, again, we're crediting these guys with, um, <laughs> with genius mentality. You know, there's no way that they can line up all the different things that can happen, you know, along the way. So I think it's a, it's a mix of everything, you know, incompetence, uh, a mix of some people, you know, taking advantage of that. If you look at the petrol scarcity uh, as well, um, you will find in some petrol stations that the petrol is there, but they're just, you know, not Hold selling, mm -hmm. and then they're selling at a premium. Um, so, oh, again, all that is a mixture of people deciding at some point to take their own you know, share of the pie, regardless of the problems it's creating for fellow Nigerians. There are a lot, a lot of questions that need answers. I, I had the presidential candidate of the, I think the SDP here yesterday, and he was talking about the fact that changing of the Naira shouldn't be as big of a deal as it is right now, because uh, he made me mention, I'm, I'd like to quote him directly, um, that under the now governor of Anambra State, Charles Saludo, we did have, it, you know, we changed the polymer from, and it was very seamless. Why is this particular one? Um, you know, because I'm guessing nobody would have talked about the timing or anything if it was seamless as it should be. So again, you talked about the issue of incompetence. Now we heard this morning that the federal government is, has given a directive to, um, you know, petroleum marketers or pump price uh, p people who are in um, filling stations to make sure that they take transfers or POS point of sale, you know, um, payment. Uh, and, and I asked the question, if bank platforms are not working, transfers are hanging in the air, why not deal with that before giving these directives? It's like pouring water on the back of the chicken. So are we really helping the situation or are we fueling, you know, the fear and the anger that people yeah, already have? Um, you know, it's interesting that uh, sometimes in life, there, is, there are coincidences that are unplanned. Now, about uh, two months ago, or thereabouts, uh, I did come across an article that talked about the JAPA. And to the extent that it pointed out that we were going to really experience a lot of problems uh, in terms of in the banking sector, um, fintechs and whatever, because a lot of the brains were, you know, leaving. 
Mm -hmm. And to that extent, that was even before uh, all this catastrophe started. And I, when this started happening, I thought, hmm, you know, quite interesting. Um, someone had kind of... Uh, Preempted this. Yes, and um, talked about the problems that... You see, there is an impact, and I think there's a consequence to, you know, in some, in some of these institutions, um, and not just the banks, you have whole departments leaving. You know, mm. just up and go, and not even with your normal notice and what have you. So um, there's a lot, and then you compound that. Remember that there was a notice period of 90 days given for us to go through all these changes and what have you. So I think that there was abundant time uh, for, uh, again, you know, it depends. I don't know how much you had stashed at home, but I think the average person that probably maybe had 200K or something, you know, lying in a safe to maybe somebody who had 10 million. Uh, I'm not sure it would take that long to, to mm. move 10 million out of your home safe uh, into, into the bank. Yeah, the challenge I don't think is moving the money. The mm. challenge is getting money back because there are a lot of people who are not into 21st century banking who would rather keep their monies at home because of the excessive charges, the transfer. I mean, it's so much, especially now. I send somebody money, they take my money. The person who receives the money, money is taken from him. So, again, why would people want to put their monies in banks if there are no incentives? That's the first question. Now, um, you're b making me bring my money to the bank and you're promising me that you give me the new money. Now, I have given you my money. I need my money to eat. I need my money to do stuff. I cannot get access to that money. This is where the problem is. Not necessarily mm -hmm. with people putting their monies in. They mm -hmm. want money back because now... The average person who sells something on the streets is not taking the old money. That's because the CBN has said, oh, we're taking in the old money and giving you new money. But where is the new money? That's the question. Yeah, um, you know, that's a difficult one to figure out. And I think that if we put it down to the conspiracy theory, <laughs> <laughs> that means somebody, maybe the person who wrote the article, had seen this and had seen it to the point where he also felt and knew that people were not going to accept uh, you know, anything. And he also knew that the banks were not going to be able to, their machines were not going to work and, and all of that. I think the combination of everything now culminating at this stage, you could say that perhaps with the election, you know, just on the corner. But remember, this was meant to have been over by uh, this January yes. um, sometime. Um, I, I put it down to a combination of... Um, uh, perhaps the inability of people to execute properly, um, the, the whole idea of um, trying to become a digital um, and cashless system. A cashless environment um, without maybe necessarily carrying the people along sufficiently. Um, but I think that you know Nigerians in their ingenious ways uh, do find ways around. Some are cashing in on it, sadly. Uh, by charging, you know, you're now, now you <laughs> now, now have a black Naira market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. so, and unfortunately, some are cashing in on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I suspect that this is going to um, settle down. We will find ingenious ways of, um, you know, trade by barter. And perhaps I think what the, a lot of the, the angst too is about um, the politics of it relating to how do you now how do you carry on the whole process of giving people money to vote? So we might now see people taking credit for voting. Hmm. Very yeah, so you vote on credit. Hmm. I'd love to see how that works. But let's just come back to President Buhari and taking a look back at <coughs> the... Um, I always ask people what posterity would remember President Buhari for, for a presidency that rolled into office on the wings of fighting corruption, putting an end to Boko Haram and terrorism, um, underemployment and, uh, and unemployment. Um, have we really seen you know, these things worked on under this administration? And how well can you say that President Buhari has done in terms of communicating with the people, the state, and um, uh, delivering on the dividends of democracy? I think that um, 
he's going to have a hard time with introspection. I think when he has his quiet moment away from the maddening crowd uh, and the choir, uh, he's going to be thinking, I didn't do as well as I could have done or should have done. I listened to the wrong people. And I think that for anybody who is in a position of leadership and power, that's something that you have to think about very, very hard. Who are you going to have surrounding you? Um, certainly, the nepotistic um, aspect of the whole thing, you know, stinks. Uh, the idea that you have uh, people who are your service chiefs and everything all coming from the same uh, neck of the woods. When the constitution speaks uh, roundly against that, mm -hmm. Um, and doing it with reckless abandon, you know, with that cavalier, I don't care attitude. Uh, I certainly think that that's something that uh, there's no way you can communicate that. It's just wrong. Um, and that inability to really do the right thing because it's right and don't do the wrong thing because it's wrong. Uh, he didn't really provide a good example. A leader of a country is also kind of like almost a spiritual um, bar barometer of the con country. He sets the moral compass of where the country, you know, needs to go. And, mm -hmm. and people watch and they follow after. So um, there are some things that he obviously has done well. But, you know, when you do something well, but you have something that is really terrible, it clouds over, you know, um, those good elements. So I think that uh, the very fact that the currency has nosedived um, in relation to the reference currency um, really has been bad for the economy. Uh, I think the fact that, you know, the statistics are showing very, very negative numbers, the multidimensional uh, people living in poverty, mm -hmm. um, the high rate of unemployment. If you have a 4%, 5%, 6% rate of unemployment, that seem, that's, that's, you have to take that very seriously and it raises concerns, not to talk about getting to 33, 40%. I mean, we had 12 plus um, million children out of school. I mean, let's talk about the indebtedness. Um, now, about, we're owing, I think, about 77 trillion naira in debt. I mean, that means that each Nigerian owes about 348,864 by the end of President Buhari's tenure. So, a good will, mathematician. Uh, <laughs> it means that oh no, somebody had to work that out for me. <laughs> but so, we, we obviously owe so much. And don't forget, there, there's, there was a, another one that the president um, asked the National Assembly to quickly approve because. Uh, the longer that we wait, the more money uh, that we have to borrow. Um, for that also, a lot of Nigerians are worried because uh, the economy is you know, facing a huge downturn. Um, our investments are not as great. Our oil is being stolen, I mean, in the open. And Mr. President sits as Minister of Petroleum and has sat there for the whole of his tenor. Um, and before 2022 came to a close, uh, the NNPC had not remitted any money into the national coffers. What do you have to say about that? About the non-remittance or about everything? And everything <laughs> that we owe. <laughs> um, well, that debt is going to increase. I think that this year, um, 2023 budget, they're asking for another, there's a deficit of about yes. 11 trillion. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's going to go on top of what exists already. And how we're paying it back um, isn't yet clear to observers. Mm -hmm. So we're digging further into uh, the gutter. Now, what makes that sad is that budget came out with um, an analysis that said that some of the uh, budgetary items, there are over 400 repeated items. Now, that is crazy. Then you then have a national assembly that is actually meant to be your and my representatives who are really meant to scrutinize all of this and say, hey, hold on, Mr. President, um, we're not going to approve this. Um, 
But instead of that, you even have the opposite happening where they say, oh, look, listen, this budget isn't really as high as it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, let's put in some more. Um, so there's a whole lot going on that is wrong in the executive and in the legislative arm. Who There's meant to be that check and balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once the check isn't working, then the other is going to do whatever you know, it likes and, and, and what have you. So you have the NNPC, as you mentioned, <clears throat> in a typical organization, if that organization isn't doing right, um, then you, you don't just sit there and let it continue. You, there have to be some remedial actions that but, are taken. But then the NNPC has been christened and rechristened and we've window dressed it over and over again and maybe that's not working either. Yeah, um, it's really not what you call it that matters, but it's really about um, what actions, who is it accountable to? And therefore, if it's accountable to the executive, then it's either the, the head of that agency or company or whatever has to roll, uh, yeah. or it's given some kind of ultimatum, and then when it then sort of like picks up. Interesting. Final, because my guys are saying we have to go. Um, Everybody is angling, uh, campaigning, asking for the... I mean, you're also asking for votes because you want to be governor of Lagos. But then the seat of power, which is also the presidency, there are many people who are running for it. Some say it's a two-horse race, some say it's a three-horse race, four-horse race, you know. But the, we have at least 16 people who are running for that office. But all of the problems that we, you and I have been discussing, how easy is it going to be for the first four years for whoever decides or whoever emerges come um, February 25? In closing. Well, you know, when you um, want to take up a job like that of presidency, you already know the problems that are there. If you're incapable of being a problem solver, then you shouldn't go anywhere near it. Uh, but but you, that's not the case in, in, in Nigeria, in is Nigeria. it? Well, um, it's not the case because um, we haven't really selected based on the ability of the person, you know, to really do the job. I think. Uh, at least I'm aware that this last uh, eight years, it really was a question of, look, let's just get the, the previous ones out and, you know, let's just put somebody new in there. But I think we've reached the age of enlightenment that Nigerians this time around, uh, I would be very, very surprised uh, at the outcome because people are asking the question, mm. uh, what's this person done? What's he going to do? Uh, and that's why it's not, you see, it's not an easy race. Mm. This thing is tearing everybody inside out. Mm. <laughs> it's not business as usual. Well, Akin Bridgeways is the governorship candidate of the National Rescue Movement, NRM, and he is running for governor in Lagos. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Same here. All right. Thanks. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll be talking about um, other issues, of course, matters arising and the situation of, of course, uh, INEX plan to utilize the Lagos Parks and Management Committee for Election Logistics. Stay with us.